Up next is Rebecca Sanchez from the Royal Tyrrell Museum, uh, talking about techniques utilized to isolate and prepare chondrichthian vertebrae and sub-millimeter sized denticles for photography and description. Great. Thanks, David. So, um, a lot of words there. <laughs> um, basically, it meant that I had to remove a string of vertebrae uh, from a block that were associated. It was about 16 in number. Uh, and I also had to isolate and prepare sub-millimeter sized denticles, about 0.3 millimeters in size, from the cartilage surrounding these vertebrae uh, to get them ready for scanning electron microscope and research. So a little bit of background. The specimen I worked on was Myelodaphus bipartitis. Uh, it's the only exclusively known freshwater genus of Myelodaphus, and it resembles a cross between a stingray and a shark. And there's not a lot known about this guy. Uh, the most complete specimen we have is actually in our collections here, and there is no associated caudal material with this guy. Uh, my specimen, 2006 3813, is the only one with known associated caudal material at all. Um, the only pieces we usually find of Myelodaphus are isolated teeth and uh, uh, centra. And the fact the name bipartitis comes from the biparted root of the teeth that you see here. And this is an extant bowmouth guitar fish, um, so it's living today. And just to show you a little bit what they uh, look like. So some background again. Uh, it was found in the Dinosaur Park formation, it was about 75 million years. And it's at the base of a mud-filled river channel with a lot of marine influence, so marine mussels, freshwater fish like bowfin. Um, and we found it in 2006. Unfortunately, we were unable to collect it until 2011, so it was sitting there for a bit. So the initial pieces we found were the string of associated vertebrae here and a large chunk of cartilage. And we flagged those ones and then um, got down on our stomachs here, you can see, with our hand lenses and um, picked up the majority of um, where the uh, elements were eroding from out of the wash slope and defined a ridge of where that majority was coming from to limit the size of the jacket. As it was, it ended up being over 100 pounds. Um, so we capped the um, cartilage and vertebrae with a gypsona cap first just to protect it a little bit more. Then we put um, burlap, or well, lots of layers of separator. Cannot stress enough how much good separator does. And the um, burlap with hydrocal FGR, which is our field plaster. Uh, we had to actually add wooden supports because the matrix was so crumbly. It's called popcorn bentonite, and it will just fold in on itself if it's not very well supported. Uh, we were unable to collect it for a couple months, so we left it on a ridge here um, to limit moisture exposure. And then we had to hand carry the block back to our vehicle about two kilometers away. Um, so this is the block back to the lab here. That's the gypsona cap I was mentioning. So there's a lot of separator underneath that gypsona cap, and then there was a lot of separator on top of that. Um, and this matrix is so crumbly, like, it was just sticking to everything, so I was really glad we put that gypsona cap on top so that everything stayed in place. Um, we decided to open it from the top up, the erosional surface, because uh, it was so fragile, so eroded, and the matrix wasn't really supporting itself. Uh, we were hoping that we could trace it where the fossil was, and we were still hoping that there was a lot more in the block than we actually found. And here you can see I've isolated that vertebral column. There was nothing around it, and then the cartilage chunk is right there. So uh, the original plan was to grid the entire section with a 10 by 10 centimeter grid section. It's uh, made of brass tubing in-house. Um, this is uh, the car cartilage section, which I pulled and placed into a separate container. The vertebral section I also pulled from the main block once we realized there's nothing around it. Uh, I pulled a lot of matrix surrounding it as well just to keep it all together and put it into a stabilized container. Um, the rest of the material I found, I pulled out, placed in vials based on species. There was a lot of marine influence, the, the bowfin material. There's also some turtle. Um, and placed them into their respective grid sections. So then the rest of the, the top one inch of the matrix was screen washed separately uh, with water and then further with hydrogen peroxide, which broke down the bentonite material. And you can see the white bubbles in there. That means it's actually doing something. The remainder of the jacket uh, was bulk screen washed separately again and in water, uh, and it's still waiting to be sorted. So this is the removal of the vertebrae. Um, I was at this time that we realized that the, the cartilage surrounding this vertebrae was very rich in very tiny denticles, as I said, 0.3 millimeters in size. So I was actually working on this under a microscope, luckily. Um, 
So once we realized that, I, as I said, there has been no caudal material found with myelodaphis, so um, one of our curators got really excited about this uh, and decided that I had to remove these little tiny denticles from the cartilage surrounding it, and he was going to use them to compare between species of myelodaphis, within species of myelodaphis, and even along the vertebral column of an individual myelodaphis, because we had never actually seen associated denticles with myli. Um, so I arbitrarily called the point furthest from me, number one, all the way through to number 16, uh, which was closest to me. And then the material I pulled, so I pulled chunks of cartilage that surrounded the top half of the vertebral column. I left the, the bottom half covered in the matrix and placed them in vials dependent on which vertebral number they came from. We only ended up getting enough cartilage and denticles from six specimens to actually be worthwhile, so we pulled another three samples from the grid section that surrounded the vertebral column that I mentioned earlier. All right, so uh, to get the denticles out of the cartilage, I created a two-step process. First, I put a little sample of cartilage into a separate vial and put it with acetone. And this was because while I was working on the specimen, as I said, it was very fragile and eroded. I had to use a lot of paraloid on it, unfortunately. So to get the denticles out of the cartilage and paraloid mess, I put acetone in it, swirled it around for a little bit, let it dry. Then I put water inside, filled the vial up half full, and placed it into a sonic bath. It's similar to what jewelers use to clean their wares. It's a uh, pulsing machine there. And I checked for damage after 10 seconds, and there was no, and I noticed there was none. And I noticed that the denticles were coming out really nicely. So the optimal time after experimentation was about 10 minutes in the sonic bath to break up the majority of the cartilage. Um, afterwards, I rinsed it out into a nice four dram vial lid, which I stole from collections, so they got a lot of <laughs> vials missing their caps. <laughs> Um, and uh, they worked really nicely because they've got a really nice ridge that caught the material as it was coming out and uh, was easily coverable and could move between the microscopes. Uh, once I isolated the denticles, I put them into pill capsules and then placed the pill capsules into a nice uh, glass one dram vial. And then in this picture here, you can see the types of denticles and the vertebral column they came from. So transferring and actually manually preparing these denticles was a very nerve-wracking process. I ended up surrounding myself in plastic and foam uh, to catch any that wanted to jump away from me. Um, one thing was when I transferred the, the denticles into the pill capsules, um, the pill capsules are gelatinous and I used uh, a damp brush to kind of use the tension to hold the denticle while I put it into the pill capsule. So they ended up sticking to the sides of the pill capsule, but that actually worked in my favor because there's a lot of static electricity in the lab and sometimes they like to jump. So uh, they actually stuck to the vial lid, so if the vial lid got knocked over or anything um, that was holding the, the pill capsule, it was, they were all still stuck to the, <laughs> the, the pill capsule for me. Um, so I mentioned I manually prepared some of these fossils. There was still some glue and matrix stuck to them. So I used a sharp set of tweezers, my mic trusty microscope, and a size triple zero insect pin and scraped the matrix off those 0.3 millimeter denticles. Um, so here's me transferring some of the denticles onto the stubs. So we picked um, the best ones and two larger thorns uh, to be SEM'd. And you've, they are actually on the stub at this point. You can't actually see them. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the stubs are quite sticky. So when we went to take our pictures, we did two per denticle, so we had to reposition them on the stub, uh, and the black stub material adhered to the porosity parts of the denticles. So to, do, uh, to get rid of the, the stickiness of the stub, I put a little bit of water on first before I tried to move the denticle, and then once the water dried, the denticle retained its, or the, sorry, the stub retained its adhesiveness. Um, but some uh, of the stub glue did actually stick to the denticles, so again, I had to manually prepare the denticles, getting rid of that black stub stickiness. Uh, so once we cropped off the, the images, we moved on to the vertebral column. And this is ammonium chloride dusted. So uh, it really brings out the specimen, makes it, uh, it reflects the blue of the LED lights that we use, and uh, makes any, everything come out in sharp contrast, especially when you turn it into black and white. So there's the column there, and there's all the denticles. And then these are isolated centrum that we pulled from the site as well that I did a little bit of prep work with. So months of preparation and isolating denticles, and we came up with this one image. Um, 
but they're really helpful. They're going to be used for uh, comparison, as I said, between myelodiaphysis, within myelodiaphysis, and even within individuals. Uh, vertebral column shows um, features that have never been seen before on myelodiaphysis because we have never seen caudal elements of myelodiaphysis before. Right? Uh, so I ended up developing some new to me techniques and hopefully something new to you guys. And thanks to everyone with their patience and my great learning experience. <laughs> Questions?